I decided I was going to contest for the president, I felt that I didn't want Jonathan, the president, to hear on the news. I booked an appointment to go and see him. I didn't know what I was thinking. Maybe I was just very bold that day. And I went to the villa. I sat down. I said, oh, come in, come in. I said, yes, how can I help you? And I looked at a president of, a third, of the third world. And I had the apple tree, the girls to tell him, oh, Mr. President, I just want to come and inform you. I'm going to be contesting for your seat. And Jonathan looked at me. Oh, OK, good luck, good luck, good luck. Have luck. And I walked out and thought about it that any other person, maybe I would never have left the villa. People are talking of artificial intelligence. Other nations are talking of nanotechnology, of robotics engineering. Elon Musk is talking about constricting the journey from London to New York to 31 minutes. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the topical issue in Nigeria is restructuring. Restructuring my food. To hell with restructuring. Let's improve on the quality of governance. Let's work for the people. Let's invest in education. Let's create jobs. All this madness will evaporate. Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Osasu Show. Today we are at a book launch called On a Platter of Gold, How Jonathan Won and Lost the Election by Malam Bolaji Abdullahi. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to speak with you and to learn more about the book. My pleasure, thank you very much. Can you tell me, um, if you had to point to two major indicators or factors that led to Jonathan's loss of the 2015 presidential elections, what would you attribute those two factors to be? I think the January 2012, his decision in January 2012 to remove first subsidy was a major turning point for him. That was when he lost the people. Before then, he could not do any wrong. But I think people were surprised that the person they considered to be one of them, I had no shoes, I was a poor person like yourself. People were, especially young people, were astonished that he could do that. And um, of course, the opposition politicians capitalized on that to rev it up. You know, but I think that was a major turning point for him. He never recovered from that. The second most important factor that I will point at, which I think is essentially the political, was the belief that he signed or agreed not to run for a second term. Mm. The northern political mm. elite who supported him in 2011 did so with the understanding that he was going to serve one term. 2015, they would have completed their second term, so they would be in contention for election. So it was smarter for them to support Dr. Jonathan in 2011, believing that he would serve only one term. So by going back on that agreement, many of them uh, felt they had a duty to punish him. You are a product of his administration. So do you, how do you deal or how do you react to the backlash that this book would be a betrayal or a form of disloyalty to the former president who is also your former boss because you were a serving minister in his administration? I was hired to work for the government by Dr. Jonathan. I remain grateful to him. I didn't leave. He sacked me. Do you get what I'm saying? And when I left the government, you cannot point at anywhere up till this day where I had criticized Dr. Jonathan for sacking me. Then you give me a mandate that includes me betraying someone who nominated me for that position in the first place by openly attacking that person at a political rally. Then in any way, you forced me to choose, right? So when you forced me to choose, my upbringing 
recommend that I choose someone who gave me the opportunity in the first place. So, so your loyalty was la la lay with Dr. Bukola Saraki my lo as opposed to former President Gulag. I was loyal to the principle that you don't betray someone who has given you an opportunity in life. That's what I'm loyal to, was loyal to. Now, don't forget that I did not resign because the job I was doing was important to me. That's the point you are raising, mm. right? Mm. I did not resign. I only wished I would be left alone. Dr. Saraki never invited me to his political meetings. You, you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I stood for something and I was prepared for the consequences. So we take that as you don't regret your decision. Not till at this all. Day. I would do it again and again and again. Right? So he did not. You see, and, but the book is here before you. Mm -hmm. It's now left for you and whoever else is reading this book to find lines you can say, oh, but he's not fair to this man here. Why did he say this about Dr. Jonathan without substance? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you can detect malice in this book, then you can come back to me and say, I detected malice in this statement. Was it because the man fired you? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But without such, then I think it's just speculation. Malambology Abdullahi, thank you so much for your time and congratulations on the launch of your book. Thank you very much and thank you for your support. Dr. Buka Lasaraki, thank you so much for joining us in today's program. My pleasure. So, the name of the book is On a Plata of Gold, How Jonathan Won and Lost Nigeria. If you could point to one key factor of how President Goodluck Jonathan lost the election in 2015, what would that be? Well, it's difficult to point to one particular, I think there are many, many reasons why he, he lost the election. If he had, he probably, for example, would not have allowed some of us to have left the party. He would have done certain things against the fight against corruption early in the government. Um, but I think he, he didn't do a number of those things because a few of the people who were close to him gave him the impression that all was good. You are considered one of the most strategic politicians right now in the uh, political landscape. I mean, your emergence as Senate president was highly controversial. Uh, would you say in 2019, the president has to be, uh, not wary, but has to look up for people like yourself who might be looking to contend, uh, contest the power in 2019? I've said you will not, you be, I think you're like the 10th person has asked me, so there's a queue. I promise the first person that asked me that I would, when it's time to talk about 2019, I'll answer the question. So it would be unfair on me not to answer would that you? person. Okay. So I'll answer the question. <laughs> I'll give an opportunity next year. Okay. Anytime next year from February, mm -hmm. you can ask us about what, what are my intentions in 2019, whether I want to come back to the Senate. But the cards whether, are on the table. As I said, <laughs> the, if you want to talk about development, how we're we going to get the country going, yes. Mm -hmm. We have many, many, long time to talk about it in 2019. Okay, but very lastly, because I know you have to run and I really Thank appreciate you. this mm -hmm. interview. Um, in the book, we talked about, Bology had talked about how you played a key role in mm -hmm. uh, ensuring that uh, Yardua emerged as the president in 2011, I, sorry, 20, 2007. Um, did you strike a deal with Dr. Odili before to support him as president? What exactly were the semantics? What happened behind the scene that uh, led to Yardo emerging as the presidential candidate of the PDP? I can see that you don't have my interest because I said <laughs> I'm going to write a book. And if I start to give those answers, my book will never sell. Um, so you're not going to make me discount the value of my book. My book will contain all those answers, you and you have to wait. And you have to wait. Yeah, you have to wait for my book, and I hope when my book comes out, you give me all this backup. <laughs> Your Excellency, thank time. you so thank much. Thank you so much. You. Okay. Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Bonu State, thank you so much for joining us in today's program. Thank you. So the book we're launching today is called uh, "On a Platter of Gold: How Jonathan Won and Lost the Election." What would you attribute to the major factor that cost Jonathan the election in 2015? Well, it was, uh, thank you so much for inviting me, but it was the culmination and net effect of so many factors. The mishandling of the Chibo girl saga, the insecurity issue, the issue of corruption, the internal crisis within the PDP, 
and of course the poor sense of judgment of the former president because he was literally held to ransom by some forces that were well beyond his control. So it, you cannot attribute to it to a single factor, mm -hmm. but the concomitant effect of so many factors that came into play. Do you care to elaborate on those forces that held the president down? Well, it will take us the whole day <laughs> for me to elaborate on each of those the reason I say that is because a cabal is also attributed to this present administration of General Muhammadu Buhari. And when we looked at the political landscape of 2015, the same thing was attributed to Good Luck Jonathan's administration. People said he was a good president. However, the people he surrounded himself with were the issues. And now we're seeing the recurrent you know, um, remarks in this present administration. So how do we break out of this political... Uh, you know, cycle where we keep on attributing the failure of the administration to those around them versus attributing it to the leader in power. Okay, let us assume there is a cabal under the present dispensation. But the cabal did not stop the president from addressing issues of insecurity, issues of corruption. There has to be cabal in almost all dispensation. It depends on your own perception of what that cabal means. You can take it from a negative perspective. You can look at it from a positive viewpoint. In any dispensation, there will be power players, power brokers. But your ability to summon the power brokers is lonely out at the top. Your ability to make informed judgment, your tenacity of purpose, your ability to hold on to your vision is what determines the success or failure of leadership. Epicenters of power is ingrained in human nature for some people to try to exert a lot of pressure on leadership at any level, even at local government level. You will get people who are claiming to be closer to the president or the local government chairman who believe that they like the interests of Osasu better than Osasu herself. So definitely how you are able to navigate your way through the political line mind is what determines the success and failure of a leadership. In your state was the hotbed for terrorism during the Good Luck Jonathan administration, and it has de-escalated since President Buhari came into power. What would you attribute that to, given the fact that a lot of people see Boko Haram as a political insurgency group? So now they are saying that another na is in power. That's the mm -hmm. reason Boko Haram has de-escalated its attacks. Is there any truth to this? He that told Boko Haram in 2015, before he assumed the mantle of leadership, while holding on to 22 local governments out of 27 local governments in Borno State. Mm -hmm. And when I came out, at a point in time, maybe you could remember, when I came out to tell the world that the Nigerian army, that the Boko Haram are more equipped than the Nigerian army, I was subjected to the most vitriolic of attacks. I was called all sorts of names. But subsequently, I was vindicated. Sadly, how I wish I wasn't vindicated. How I wish I was proved wrong. But subsequently, Badi and so many others came and confessed that truly they were ill-equipped to meet the challenges of fighting the insurgency. And as a leader, you have to think outside the box. You have to have labors of contacts a different label so that you can get a true perspective. But how did ground. you deal with the... Obviously, we, these are just mere allegations, but how did you deal with the stigma being in the center of this insurgency? How did you deal with the stigma? Because at the time, the political party in power attributed some of these activities of Boko Haram to you. So how did you deal with that stigma? And especially as we hear from the rumor mill that you're, especially, you're looking to vie for office in 2019. What am I buying for? For one, there is no stigma whatsoever. I did not create the Boko Haram. It was a crisis that my administration inherited. Secondly, and most importantly, defense of the territorial integrity of this country rests with the center, with the federal authorities. At best, we augment their efforts. And we have been doing our best. In spite of our political differences, I made several overtures to be at peace, 
to be on the same page with the federal authority. We have given them over 400 cars in my past four years in office to the Nigerian army. We have sent billions of naira assisting them. We bought armored vehicles for the Nigerian police. But unless they want me to throw out my Akbada and go and fight the war prone, we have done virtually Are everything. Are you looking to run for human. president in 2019? I think I'm doing a great disservice to humanity and to the God we worship if I start clamoring to contest, not even for senatorial seat. Let me pick the rot in the system. Let me pick the educational system in the state. Let me pick the healthcare delivery system. We have two million IDPs in Borno. Let me make efforts for these IDPs to return back to their home state better. But personally, I have no desire to contest for any position, not even senatorial. I want to go back to school. I need a PhD, land French. You heard it here on the Osasu Show, Your Excellency Kashim Shetima. Thank you so much for joining us on this program, and we hope you will accede when next we call on you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Gali Naba, thank you so much for joining me on today's program. You are welcome. So, we're here today to launch the book called How Jonathan Lost and Won Nigeria uh, by Dr. Balaji Abdullahi. Can you tell me, in your opinion, what was the major factor that caused President Goodluck Jonathan to lose the elections in 2015? President Goodluck Jonathan was never prepared for leadership particularly at the national level. Uh, he was a provincial person. He had never known Nigeria prior to the time he became the president. It is not desirable that one begins to learn when he becomes the president. Mm -hmm. That is too expensive. What are your projections for the 2019 presidential elections? Both the opposition, which is PDP, and the ruling party, which is the APC, are not governing the country the way we expect that Nigeria should be governed. We have situations where small gods have cornered the party in their states, and the, the parties are like becoming franchises. Mm. Therefore, when parties become franchises, they don't afford a country the opportunity to present good candidates for leadership. Mm. And uh, that is my problem with what is going on today. So, I know I, I'm pushing you a little here, but do you think we're going to end up with a recipe of maybe Atiku and Buhari uh, running for office and, you know... Well, it, it, it is likely... Mm. It is likely, but uh, our In a hope case like that, who would you support? In a scenario like that, who would you support? Nobody. I would support a candidate who knows what democracy is all about and who will improve on the state of democracy, who would work with democratic institutions and other institutions, you know, for the country to be run in a way that is harmonious. Mm. There must be harmony in the way this country is governed. And in your there opinion... There must be some vision, mm -hmm. you know? And in your opinion, the present APC government does not, is not running a democracy? I don't think so. I don't think they understand what democracy is about. And that is very important. There's an initiative of the Osasu Show and TOS TV, which is called the People's Candidate. We want to get the general masses involved earlier on in the electoral process, primarily in the um, primaries of the elections, to ensure that the candidates of the people are nominated through that process by forcing political parties to make their system transparent. What advice would you give us to make that uh, effective? In the last 18 years of this democratic regime, Nigeria has not developed. The economy has not developed. We may enjoy some growth economically, but there is no development. Leaders from Obasanjo to Buhari have failed to galvanize their political parties to ensure there is no internal democracy. In fact, they don't even 
want to work with the parties. Mm. Former Honourable Speaker, thank you so much for your time. Chief John Oye, Gun Chairman of the ruling party APC, thank you so much for joining me on today's programme. You're very welcome, thank you. What do you think won Jonathan the election, one key factor that won him the election in 2011? Well, I think uh, basically Nigerians are very fair-minded people. Uh, he had taken over also with this team of Nigerian support. Nigerians insisted that the constitution must be respected in spite of all uh, pressures. So he completed the unexpired term, went for his own term. By then, of course, uh, this southern fever was there before him, the wind. He had that uh, wind behind, behind his sail. So he was able to get through because, one, he was a minority. Two, he was from the South. Three, he was seen as a nice, easygoing person, no harm to anybody. So it was easy uh, to uh, win that mm -hmm. particular election. Mm -hmm. But of course, the as time went, other factors came, came into, into play. play yeah. So approaching the 2019 elections, how do you believe if the APC decides to give President Mohamedou Buhari the ticket because mm -hmm. I believe the APC has said severally that there's no automatic um, ticket for the president. Yeah. Okay, so he would have to vie for that ticket the same as any other candidate, any other aspirant. Of course. Yeah. Okay, so if that is the case and President Mohamedou Buhari, not to be presumptuous of course, picks up that ticket, how do you believe Nigerians would react to it, given the level of corruption we've seen in this administration as well? the level of uh, suffering Nigerians are going through. Yes, we can take into cognizance the economic downturn, but uh, how do you believe he will win elections in 2019? What do you, uh, first, the accusation about the level of corruption. Oh, he sacked his SGF, uh, he sacked the DGNIA. Isn't, he has that, come out isn't to say, that good? If Jonathan had done that, may he not have been in power today? Of course he did not, and we've just heard that today with the launch of this book that he looked at monumental corruption in the face and turned away. In our case, the opposite is the, is the, the truth. There is corruption Those, and he's fighting it. There will it. always be corruption. He is okay. fighting it vigorously. When his people are involved, there's only one thing about that man. He must be sure that you are guilty. That takes a bit of time. He must be sure that when he inflicts punishment, he can go to bed at night and sleep quietly and peacefully. That he does. But at the end of the day, he does it. And you can see that those who join the APC, erroneously thinking that maybe that will give them protection, that does not happen. A lot of them are in the courts today who are still APC members who join the APC and things like that. So there's no question at all. The noise that we hear is that is because corruption is fighting back, quite naturally. So you strongly believe the All Progressive Congress has delivered enough dividends to the people that they would vote we, the we, party in again in 2019? We have perhaps not done enough to satisfy everybody. That is one. Two, there's the basic fact that the resources are leaner today. The oil market collapsed. So we are talking of crude price of $50 when we are lucky. It has gone up a bit now. So the challenges were more. But in spite of those challenges, look at the great infrastructural works that are currently underway to prepare the foundation. Very lastly, Mr. Chairman, there have been a lot of talks regarding your position as the chairman of the All Progressive Congress. Uh, the rumor mill has gone quite wild yeah. about this, and uh, the word out there is that come 2018 that you will step down as chairman. Is there any truth to this? No, my term is over. I mean, that's not true. I have a four-year term. Like in all these things, I have the option of seeking a renewal of my mandate. Okay, thank you so much, Bless. sir.
So that's it for today's program. To watch extended clips from these interviews and this event, you can visit our website, tostvnetwork.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media at The Osasu Show, at TOSTV Network, at Osasu Igbinadion, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'll see you same time, same place. Well, not the same place, back in our studios next week. And until then, take very good care of yourself. God bless you.